welcome back to the Dowie Talks Expert Series. Our guest tonight is Shifu Julian Dale. Julian is the director of Eagle Claw Kung Fu School UK, which is the only full-time Eagle Claw Kung Fu School in England. He has over 40 years of experience in martial arts, including Eagle Claw, Chen Style Tai Chi, Qi Gong, and has even trained uh, with our good friend, Dr. Ken Fish here in the United States. Julian has a fascinating training history, and I found him to be a very humble and dedicated martial artist and an asset to our community. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I have. If you like this sort of content, please hit like and subscribe. Thanks. Hi, Julian. Thanks for meeting with me today. Hi, Bill. It's good to see you again. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. Good to see you again. So uh, we'll get started where we get started with everybody at the beginning of your martial arts journey. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got started in martial arts and why? Sure. I started uh, Chinese martial arts in England, which is where I live and have lived all my life. Um, I started initially in uh, Sanda or Sancho, which is free fighting. Um, did that for a few years. Uh, found a northern Shaolin school in my local area, which I started cross training in northern Shaolin and continuing with the Sancho. Uh, and after I think it must have been about five years, I was very hungry to get to the old school martial arts and traditional Chinese martial arts. So then I. Um, Got a ticket and flew out to Hong Kong. That quickly. <laughs> what what time period was this? <clears throat> so I started martial arts in 85 and I uh, went out to Hong Kong in nine. My first trip out to Hong Kong was in 1990. 1990. In in the UK, well, I guess Hong Kong was technically part of the UK but then, but in, in England, what was the martial arts environment like during that time period? Was there a, quite a fair amount of Chinese martial arts available to learn? Martial arts was very popular during the, the sort of 70s, 80s. I mean, I would say that in the 80s, there was 70s, 80s. There was there was a big Bruce Lee boom, obviously, right. in the 70s, which was global. <clears throat> but martial arts was very popular in the UK, especially in the 80s, um, before the, the time of such distractions as the Internet and you know other things. So, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there was... I would say there was a lot more karate, taekwondo, um, more prevalent. Um, but the Chinese martial arts were were growing uh, and there was a lot of dedicated people practicing uh, throughout the whole of the UK. So when you went to Hong Kong, was your sole reason for going uh, to train or did you have a, a career path that aligned with that as well? No, I was I was uh, I was maniacal in my training when i was in england i was already training six six days a week training relentlessly uh it was something that i was extremely passionate about and found my life calling if you like so yeah. i immersed myself into it as, as much as i possibly could um and then when i was training in hong kong it was up early in the mornings it was in the mountains at 5 30 um practicing northern shaolin and um and just uh, that's when i first came into contact with the Hong Kong Chinese Martial Arts Association and became a life member there. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, yeah, the training, the the stuff, the sound show that I was doing in England was was good. Um, great fitness, great training. It was, you know, thousand sit ups in a night, thousand press ups in a night, plus all the sparring and fighting and everything else that was going on with it. Um, the Northern Shaolin that I was doing over here was a kind of eclectic mix of uh things that the teacher the, the teacher who kind of was teaching in the uk at the time he'd learn bits of different styles and you, you'd learn some sort of classic northern shaolin forms and then there would be other bits and pieces but the, but the training was good and tough um <clears throat> and then i i just wanted more more depth more quality and what, really get to the essence of it so that was the reason why i went to hong kong uh, and started training out there um, and it was back and forth between the UK and Hong Kong, stay out there for a few months, money run out, come back, continue training, get any job I could, go back. Um, and uh, at that time, when I was in the UK, I, I was learning Tai Chi from my Tai Chi teacher, who I'm still with today. Um, and uh, in 93, I got connected and met with a mutual friend of ours, Dr. Kenneth Fish, who has an extensive background in in very, very good Chinese martial arts. His background is uh, uh, Luohan Shaolin, uh, Xin Yichuan, 
and uh, also Wushin Tongwei, and prior to that was some Futsal Wing Chun. So with Ken, I learned skills, methods, and theories, and uh, um, I, I continue learning from him and uh, have a, a lifelong great friendship with him. In 1994, I started uh, the Northern Eagle Claw system with the Hong Kong branch of the system that had come down from the north uh, with uh, uh, a teacher called uh, Liu, Man, Liu Man Yun Shu Fu um, and studied with them for many years. In 2007, I started researching the roots of the Eagle Claw system uh, in China. Um, so I, I started meeting lots of the teachers of the Eagle Claw system in Hong Kong um, and, and just meeting them. So I met senior students of the famous uh, Hong Kong grandmaster, uh, Liu Fa Meng. I, I met his, uh, his uh, the, the Dai Shu Song or Dai Si Hing, of his uh, group, uh, Dang Ging Fong, uh, Chan Min Ji and, and, and others, and we were talking with them about Eagle Claw. Uh, I met some of uh, uh, Chan Zi Chong, uh, who was another famous Eagle Claw teacher. I uh, met some of his group, uh, descendants in, in Hong Kong. And then I traveled. Uh, so the Eagle Claw system came down from Beijing. It went down Beijing, Hebei, Tianjin, then down Shanghai, Hangzhou, then across to uh, Foshan and Guangzhou. So I traced the journey back up. Um, so I was the first Westerner to conduct a historical research survey and journey. So I met many of the teachers in uh, Fatsan, Guangzhou, uh, met some teachers in uh, Hangzhou, which is where my Tai Chi teacher is from. He introduced me to people there. In Shanghai, I met, because uh, uh, Eagle Claw was taught as part of the Shanghai Jin Wu curriculum. So right. there's a big presence out there. I met uh, Bao Wenguang um, and some others in, in Shanghai. Um, and along along my journey through China, I was uh, very fortunate to to have a, a great friend travel with me, uh, a guy that you probably know of, uh, Yarek Zemanski from yeah. uh, Shanghai. So, yeah, he's he's a, somebody I consider a brother um, in martial arts in the Wulin world. And he helped me... Um, especially when I went back up into to, to Beijing and uh, Yarek in those early visits, he helped me when I was in the villages. So <clears throat> in uh, Beijing, I met uh, Guo Shanghe, who is uh, from the Chan, Chan Zicheng line. Um, and then I went from Beijing to Hebei Tianjin um, and then back into uh, Xiongxian, where that's the kind of area of the, the founding village, which is called uh, Gu Zhuang Tou. And that's the, the, the source of the Eagle Claw system. And uh, I met, met, and met and interviewed many teachers there, um, also you know, teachers from other styles as well. Uh, met some, some really good people from uh, Fanzi Trend um, and also some, some kind of very good rural groups of uh, Shui Zhao. So, uh, yeah, and, and I got into the village and what it did, it gave me a very broad view of the Eagle Claw system from the source. And then you know, the, the changes or uh, differences, it's the same, same system, um, but the flavor was a little different as it had kind of come down through Shanghai Jingwu and into Foshan, uh, Guangzhou, Hong Kong. But in the village, they kind of retained the really old uh, method of uh, the family inheritance, and uh, I just found what I what I'd always been looking for. Um, you know, I I had very good very good experience and training through the Hong Kong branch, and I'm grateful for the the time that I spent there um, and the teachers and the time that that, that we did. Um, but the 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 essence of the system was was still held in the family enclave. Uh, and I continued visiting out there, visiting the teachers. And uh, in 2018, uh, I became um, a an inheriting disciple of uh, the Ying Zhao Fan Zhuan, what they call the Zhu Ting uh, ancestral system uh, in in the in the village. So I'm the first Westerner to be accepted as a family disciple, um, and uh, yeah, so now my teacher is uh, uh, Chen Zhenxin, and he's uh, 
in in the photos behind me here my taiji teachers there as well so yeah we can we continue with the eagle claw system uh, we have a full-time school the oldest in fact the oldest and only full-time eagle claw school in the uk um, i've had a full-time school over here since 1997 teaching and uh, yeah i think that's probably a brief overview i guess yeah, that's a pretty amazing story. Uh, one of the things, Eagle Claw has always interested me because, you know, as, as a kid growing up in the United States in the in the 80s, um, Eagle Claw was got, kind of popular here, at least in, in media. It wasn't easy to find a good teacher, but in especially in the eastern part of the United States, you had people like uh, Lily Lau and uh, Lung Shum and people like that. And the interesting thing about Eagle Claw was that it was one of the few types of Kung Fu that you could sort of maybe watch a video you might not learn it correctly, but you could learn it enough to, you know, twist your friend's arm or, you know, throw somebody down to the ground or something like that. I guess what I'm trying to say is it was easy to see the practical application of the system. It was easy to see that it was built for fighting. Uh, it wasn't hard to see the applications in there. Um, but like a lot of different styles of Kung Fu, there's a lot of misconceptions about the origins of the art. You know, Eagle Claw is one of those things that's attributed to UFA, you know, who, who apparently, you know, if you listen to folklore invented just about every type of good martial art there is Xingyi Chuen and, and so on and so forth could you talk a little bit about the actual historical origins of the art as you understand them from your from your research and your journey so uh even the family we still attribute the source to Yufei with something called a Yushu Sanso Yu family free hands and this is based on the uh military system if you like that was taught by uh, or taught in the 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 you by Yufei to the troops, which were short, very compact line drills, um, focused heavily on combat. Um, so the the story, um, and I, I there there are lots of different perspectives and views, and you know everybody you know has has a view, and that's great. Um, the Yushu Sancho was taught within the the Shaolin Temple. So, so I can give this this perspective, <clears throat> um, amongst other things, and it was taught to the Lohan monks, um, <clears throat> and kept within within the Shaolin uh, Lohan Hall, uh, which then the Lohan monks were the fighting monks. Coming down through the, the ages, on on my website you'll see a, a family tree which kind of lists the various uh, layers of it. But we, we kind of count that the, the system started to be cohesive with the introduction by Liu Shijun, who is from our village. And Liu Shijun was a traveling tobacco salesman with a tobacco cart. Uh, he practiced uh, Ba Fan Shou, eight flashing uh, hands, um, and you could say Fan Zichen, which are very closely uh, linked. And another system called uh, Liu Hetuan, Six Harmony Boxing. On one of his travels outside the village in an area called Tianjin in the north, uh, a heavy thunderstorm occurred. <clears throat> he took refuge in a, a small temple, which I've, I've been to this temple area uh, in Tianjin. Um, there is a, a grave uh, memorial erected to him by this temple, and it's a, a big temple. There's uh, some some photos I think on my website as well. Mazhou Temple in Tianjin, and whilst uh, sort of you know sheltering from the rain, he was practicing his skill, and there were were, were two monks there. Uh, and they, the names are not always easy to to specifically say. Hundred percent, this is their name, that's their name, because the, they would use temple names or monks names. So you have uh, Fa Sheng and Dou Ji. And they said to Liu Shijun, your, your skill is very good, but it's not good for fighting. You know, these, how true this is, we don't know. But what we do know is that uh, Liu Shijun uh, took the challenge to to the Fa Sheng and Dou Ji, and, and he was uh, easily defeated or submitted three times, at which point he called out and asked to learn. And that's when he learned the Yushu Sanso from the, the two monks. And what he then did after a number of years of learning this from them, he 
he was on his travels, but he returned to the village and he started to work on synthesizing and bringing together his Bafang Sol, Liu Hetuan, and the Yu Shu San Sol, Luo Han Qin Nafa. He was teaching in the military barracks in Beijing and um, uh, he was teaching it, the army military there, primarily Yu Shu San Sol, but he started to, to bring it together uh, and when he retired and was teaching in the village, it's the the evolution started to be more into what we call now the Ying Zhao Fanzi Tuan, uh, Eagle Claw Fanzi Fanzi rotating uh, Tuan Fist. Uh, so that's really where we 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 trace the the sort of the start of the system as we have it today to Liu Shijun, who then passed it down through the Zhu Teng inheriting family. When you you say that when you when you found the sort of the source of the art, the family village, and the, that you'd found what you were looking for, what was it specifically that you uh, were particularly satisfied with there as um, you encountered earlier? They have they have their own approach to the way they practice and train. They have their own skills that uh, didn't necessarily I hadn't necessarily seen before. Um, they had. They they just they they have a a way of doing it that I was very happy with. Was it the training methodology um, that that you approved of, or was it some, something more specific than that? Um, well, training is training, practice is practice. They have uh, keys and elements that, that that they keep within the family. Um, I think sometimes when you when you find the right place for you, then it's right. Yeah. And I found yeah. the right place for me. Yeah, I understand that. So at this time period, you, you talked before about studying with Ken Fish. How, how far apart were these, uh, how far apart was this um, meeting with this ancestral village and your, your training with Ken? <clears throat> So with with Ken, whenever I saw him in America or whenever he was over here, we we, we would train. Um, um, we spend a lot of time, and we're in very good online communication. Um, so the skills and methods that I learned from Ken Fish is, is skills, methods, and theories from the Lohan Shaolin. Some of the skills from uh, Wu Xing Tongbei, and some of the skills from from Xing Yi Chuan. And Ken, I have to say, Ken was extremely generous in so far as he. His whole approach was, I don't want to teach you a whole system, so I just want to teach you things that are going to improve your skill. And they have a significant impact on my view of, of, of traditional Chinese martial arts training methods, the Shen Fa, the body method. Yeah. So I learned stepping skills, stance skills, um, body mechanics, um, all, all sorts of bits that were to help me improve my eagle claw skill. And uh they've had a considerable impact on my on my personal training um, but also that i continue sharing that knowledge through the school uh and it, it, my my students develop skill through everything all my collective knowledge and learning over the years so yeah i mean i've known ken since 93 uh started eagle claw in 94 and started researching in 2007 through china did you find a lot of uh, similarities between things that you picked up from Ken and things that you'd learned um, in China uh, during your Eagle Claw research? <clears throat> I think that um, the body mechanics and uh, the flavor of the way they did things. So Ken's Ken's background for his mm. uh, for his Xing Yi, his Luo Han Shaolin, and his Tong Bei, uh, he, he learned uh, through families, well well known families in Taiwan. And uh, all of the families that he learned with had a very heavy combat emphasis background on their training and the way they did things. Um, so, yeah, that kind of gelled really well with the, the stuff that I was doing in the village. So, I mean, in the village, they say, we don't care how good you look when you move. We only care how effective you are when you move. Yeah. So, you know, they have a different approach on things. You, you seem from like uh, the way that you talk about your your early training and, and, and the things that you appreciate of martial art that you're very um, uh, 
reality oriented. You know, uh, you're you're you seem to be more into the practical aspects of the art. Um, can you talk about? Can you talk a little bit about how you train your own students, as far as that sort of thing is concerned? So I believe that traditional Chinese martial arts, uh, they 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 become quite bloated with forms and routines. Forms and routines are great. But the, you reach a point where you think, you know, how much do you need? So uh, less is more, in my opinion, but the quality of what you've got is really important. So my students go through qi ben gong training. They go through lots of basic body training. They go through lots of ling gong uh, conditioning and power training. They're, 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 there's qi gong and nei gong that they learn. There's two two person partner drills, um, conditioning drills, and yes, there's forms. We have northern routines and forms. Um, I think that the eagle claw system, if you look at it from a top view, there's something like sixty plus, if not more, routines in it. And really, in the village, we kind of say twelve, fifteen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, the Eagle Claw system gives you the breadth to develop whatever skills you like. If you want to do forms, there's plenty to do, if that's what you're, what you're interested in. If you want to do the conditioning and power training and just the, the TT fire, the application and function training, plenty of that. Um, so my students go through lots of basics, lots of drills, lots of conditioning, uh, you know, all the Eagle Claw training on the fingers and the hands, the Iron, we don't do iron palm or iron fist. We do cotton palm, cotton fist, uh, bridge training. So it, we have a very comprehensive and systematic approach to the training. You, If you leave out one aspect, okay, maybe you don't want to do it. So if you're a, a pianist or, or something like that, a violinist, maybe don't do so much the conditioning because it may not work well for your job. Right. Um if you're not and you want to do it, yeah, just go for it. So I've tried to ensure that we have a comprehensive, systematic, layered approach to our training that develops well-rounded skills. Um, yeah, there are forms they can learn. I think we've got about 25 routines. I, I got rid of a lot of stuff. Um, and uh, with my teachers in China, uh, they they. They know lots of routines as well, but they only teach what's necessary in line with the uh, the Zuteng ancestral method. So, yeah, we kind of streamline things and just keep it very focused on developing skill. Rounded, well-rounded skill. Could you talk a little bit about the conditioning, like with the hands and things like that? Something yes, we, <clears throat> we do cotton palm, which is called uh, Mian Zhang. Uh, then we also do cotton fist, which is Mian uh, Mian Swan. Um, so we do bag slapping, we do bag punching, uh, we do uh, tendon exercises for strengthening the fingers and the gripping and the grabbing. Uh, we we, we strengthen the the bones and this in the arms in the shins. Um, there's, there's kicking and foot striking exercises. Um, so we we developed very much in in similar principle. Uh, Soft as cotton on the outside, hard as iron on the inside. Now, I know that you have a background in herbology as well, herbal medicine and things of that nature. Uh, is that something that started at the very beginning of your martial arts practice, or is that something that you picked up later on the way? Uh, no. So I started uh, alternative medicine, uh, new clinical nutrition and, and, and holistic healthcare because I was interested in that even back in, I think I started that before 1990 um, and I have gone on to learn uh, acupressure uh, and point point work uh, the the Chinese meridian clocks uh, the 24-hour clocks of which they're two and they need to overlap to get real good function uh, I make my own did uh, you know the fall and strike wine we've got internal and external medicine um, and my my teacher's uh, family, they, my teacher's wife, her family has a, uh, a very famous uh, sort of 300 year history of traditional Chinese medicine uh, through her grandfather. And my teacher's wife spent 
15 years doing apprenticeship study with her grandfather. So her knowledge of acupressure, massage, traditional Chinese massage and, and medicine is very, very good, exceptionally good, um, and very, very deep as well. And it was it wasn't like a classroom learning. It was you follow the teacher and you learn as you go. So, uh, yeah, they're very good. Very good. Is that something that you teach in your school as well? <clears throat> I don't teach it because I, I don't consider myself qualified enough to teach it. But I treat student injuries here. And whenever my teacher and his wife are in, in the UK, as they are often here with us, uh, there's a whole queue of students who uh, can they book in So uh, yeah, for treatment. Um, and uh, she's always very busy looking after them um, uh, for all sorts of injuries and things. Not not necessarily injuries that they incur during the school, but uh, you know they've got back trouble, knee or elbow or shoulder or something like that. So yeah, she's always always treating people. Um, martial arts injuries, yeah, I've got all the poultices and medicines uh, and the internal medicines as well. Interesting. That's always nice to have that knowledge. Have you ever considered, um, given that you spent so much time and are one of the only people from the West to have done this, have you ever considered writing a book about your uh, Eagle Claw studies? Um, <laughs> research? Uh, yeah, I, I have. I find myself so busy teaching all the time um, that I I haven't done as much work on the book as I as I should have because I'm just busy teaching all the time. Uh, the school is open six days a week and I'm teaching morning uh, and I'm working at, at the school from nine to 12. And then I'm at the school from four till 10 every night. So my my days are quite long and quite busy here. Um, so I have got a book um, and it will contain a lot of the so research journey material, photos, information about teachers, play, people, places. Um, uh, I just need to, yeah, I need to stop doing one thing and just have the time to do the other thing. As, as it's just a lot of work. Um, yeah. I recently finished a, a two hundred page instructor training manual for my students, wow. uh, which is, yeah, I mean it's instructors only. Um, Actually, I've got a copy of it here. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a 200-page book. Very nice. It's a book in itself, but it, it goes through everything you need to know about, you know, uh, teaching, training, and all sorts of pictures, oh, and all, all, the, all the terminology and language. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of the stuff is, is I, I have this material, but I've just put it together for my students. So, yeah. Um, there's only about 10 copies of that out there for instructors and seniors. Uh, but yeah, you're not the first person to say, when's your book coming out? Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. A common, it's a common story with martial arts teachers, you know, that they don't have the time to finish their books. But I mean, it's a good problem to have, right? You know, that's, that you're too busy teaching to write. Yeah, I, I guess the other thing is in, in the lockdown where we had this, uh, the lockdowns, I I created the, fir the world's first online Eagle Claw uh, foundation training skills program um, so that's accessible anywhere in the world by people um, so I had time to video and record content which I had, didn't have before because I was just so too busy all the time so I've, I've done that and uh, a few years ago we translated one of the books uh, out of Hong Kong uh, by Grandmaster uh, Liu Fa Meng that uh, had never been translated into English so I, I did that so, I mean, there's there's bits and pieces out there that, that people might find of interest. You, I think you mentioned earlier that you're one of the one of the few, if not the only um, Eagle Claw teachers in the UK. Um, outside of the UK, how, how happy are you in general with the quality of instruction at Eagle Claw? Do you think that it, it's a fairly decent quality in the West or do you think it's it's lacking? Uh I would say there are a lot of very hardworking teachers who dedicate their time and effort into passing on the skills and knowledge that they that they have. So everybody's working to a common goal of, of uh, passing on their knowledge to their students in a positive way. It's a good answer. Um, so going back to your training just a little bit, you know, you mentioned that you had a little something for everybody in there, depending on what their uh, area of interest was in what what kind of 
emphasis do you place on weapons? Do you teach weapons much at your school? Yeah, yeah, we teach uh, four four classic weapons: broadsword, uh, staff, spear, uh, straight sword. But we also do three section staff, halberd, uh, daido, uh, big knife, um, uh, double daggers. Yeah, um, s- solo forms and two two person weapon fighting forms. Um, so students learn them along the way. Do you get a lot of people that are that come to you uh, looking for forms and weapons and things like that, or do you would you say that more of your students come to you looking for a uh, fighting ability? I think that it's a broad spectrum. People come for their own particular needs, and we don't hold anything back. We just teach things along the journey, along the way of of of, of learning. So they, they learn learn things systematically. Um, but we teach. I teach very openly. Uh, because I want my students to be better than me. What took me 30 years, I want them to do it in 10 because they have the access and the ability to do that. That's a great attitude for a teacher to have because I find a lot of times in the martial arts world, you have teachers that are are very good martial artists, but they don't necessarily teach their students to surpass them for whatever reason, whether it's a reason out of business or or ability. So I appreciate that that you do that, try to get your students to surpass you. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, you also have a Chen Tai Chi background, right? So my Tai Chi teacher in, from Hangzhou, uh, Jian Chengji, Jian Chengji, uh, Shufu, uh, I've learned, uh, the Yang family short form from him, um, uh, Chen style, large frame cannon fist from him, uh, various methods of Qigong. Um, and I, I again, we, we also teach Tai Chi and Qigong in my class and my school for those that want to do it. And yeah, I think um, I started that because I was interested in uh, Neja, internal arts as well. Um, you know, there's no internal without external. There's no external without internal. Right. Yeah. Is uh, Does meditation play a role in your school at all? Uh, I teach meditation um, practice to those that want to learn it. So yeah, there are meditation uh, practices that we, we have. I keep it very grounded. I don't go into the esoteric, uh, out-of-your-head stuff too much. Anything that I teach, I teach so that it's very much within the body, very grounded and very rooted. Um, uh, yeah, I, 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 people say, can you teach spiritual stuff? It's like, How? no, I can't teach you anything to do with that. Uh, it doesn't matter what I know or what I don't know. I just, I won't teach that because I, I don't don't want people to get lost in that kind of practice and i see a lot of people that have become psychologically slightly unhinged um yeah Yeah. so i i I only stay within very grounded earth practices that that are good for the health and well-being yeah i think that's wise i also think those are the most useful practices to people on a day-to-day basis my Mm. um so Given all that you've seen, both in the West and in the East as well, uh, what what do you think the place of these traditional arts are in the 21st century? And, and where do you think that they're going? Um, they will continue because there are pockets of very dedicated practitioners uh, who are passionate about passing on the knowledge. I the world has changed significantly since the big Bruce Lee boom days when everybody wanted to become a master. Um, and there were just hundreds of 10 minute masters everywhere. You know, we have the internet, we have access to everything and you've got MMA, the, the, the big sort of UFC stuff. So the, the environment and the world has changed. It's moved on quite considerably, but there are a lot of very dedicated, hardworking teachers passing on traditional systems. And once people understand what's being taught i think that's probably something worth mentioning is that when i have students come to the school they know what they want but they don't really know what they need yeah and it it takes me a while to expand their thinking so i can teach them what what our system is about not just martial arts and as time goes past and they start to see and understand more they become hungry for the old method the old systems so that's when their passion really starts to ignite. So I think that 
with that kind of passionate, dedicated passing on of knowledge, uh, it won't ever be like karate or taekwondo or, or, or MMA. It won't ever be like that. And that's okay too. The systems will only die if we give up. Uh, and in England, there's a very strong community of traditional Chinese Kung Fu people with deep skill, deep knowledge. They've done their time, they've trained, they've researched, they've done their travels. Um, and yes, it's not massively widespread, but it's very active. So every two years uh, since 2013, I organized something at my school called the UK Kung Fu Gathering. And I invite many of my friends uh, from the world of traditional Chinese martial arts, and we all come together. And uh, we did this in last year, um, 2023 in October, when my teacher and his wife were over. And we had 25 teachers of traditional Chinese martial arts together. Um, my school can only hold so many people. You know, we had a, like 130 people crammed in here, which was quite busy. So there, there is, a, you know, there's a there's a community. It just doesn't sit at the top of the the social profile, but right. it's there, and it's very hard working and very dedicated. And there's some really highly skilled people out there. So I think the future is, if we follow the ancestors and we honor the ancestors of our system, we'll never stop passing it on. So we'll always have people who will inherit from us. And, and take it forward and i think i think that's why we will continue and you you'll always if you look hard enough you'll always find something it's like in my town hard people know we're here but people don't really know we're here but i've been teaching full time since 1997 down here um and people will say oh we've lived in maidenhead for 30 years we never knew you were here it's okay but you found us when the time was right 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 yeah, yeah. Yeah, that happens. And I, I, I think it, maybe it's always kind of been that way that this these arts are just sort of, uh, there are some people that are hardwired for these arts and they, they find yeah. them to find them. And then once you get a taste, you know, you don't want to give it up. No, absolutely hooked. Yeah, absolutely hooked. So I think the future is uh, we will still be here teaching, training, um, passing on the knowledge uh, and people will continue learning. And that's OK. As long as we do that, that's how we honor the ancestors and honor our teachers. I agree. Well, Julian, it was awesome to get a chance to talk to you again. Um, could you tell people where they can find you at? Yeah, so th first of all, thanks very much for having me on, Bill. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, talk and share some thoughts on the uh, Yingzhou Fan uh, system from northern China. <clears throat> so my full-time school is based in Maidenhead in Berkshire in the UK. Uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to put up a web link, um, which... Uh, um, people can use to find me. Um, so if you just search Eagle Claw Kung Fu School UK uh, or my name, <laughs> yeah, good and bad, I'm sure you'll find plenty out there. Um, but yeah, if you if you put uh, Eagle Claw Kung Fu School UK, most people will be able to find us through that. Um, and there's information on my website about the family, the history, the school, uh, and all sorts of stuff. Fantastic. It'll give something people to look for. Uh, thanks again, Julian, and I hope we can do it again soon sometime. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Absolute pleasure. I'd be happy to come back on board anytime we can. Definitely. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye.